So uh, thank you to the committee for allowing us time to focus on pediatrics, because we always um, love to be able to talk about our kids and what we can do to improve their health. Um, so um, just I wanted to talk and disabuse the idea that COVID um, doesn't affect kids, because it certainly does. And um, in my job as a pediatric infectious disease doctor who sees kids in the hospital, very sick kids, um, I do want to just maybe present a case of Miss C, uh, talk about briefly our long COVID program, and to really um, say that, yes, there are reasons to vaccinate even the very young, very young kids. So a little bit about myself. I am an infectious disease physician. I've taken care of kids uh, for over 20 years, and 15 of those uh, have um, I've been privileged to be at uh, Dornbecker. I'm a professor. Um, I am a medical director of the Infection Prevention and Control. And as many of us, um, we have been talking a lot about COVID um, since March of 2020 to a variety of stakeholders. And I do believe in um, vaccinations for children, um, healthcare workers, and my family. So I want to present a case. Actually, I was going to present two cases, but you don't need to have, hear me talk so long. But I want to present one case that really struck me. And um, uh, I think it, this will call out to uh, the pediatricians, those who are interested in um, in uh, child health, and uh, to you, Representative Dexter, who is, an, I understand, an ICU doctor. So um, I'm called at 11 p.m. on a Friday by a resident uh, to discuss the case of an eight-month-old um, who was otherwise well, but she started to have fatigue and poor eating and a fever um, since Wednesday evening, so about two days now. And the family had been very worried, took her to multiple clinics who told them that the girl had a, a viral infection, that she'll get over it. And then by Friday afternoon, she really had a rash on her legs and just was not active at all. And the family, out of increasing fear for her health, uh, brought her to um, the emergency room at, at OHSU. And she looked terrible. And she ended up in the pediatric ICU, our PICU. And the resident was calling me from there on Friday night. And so pictures of her rash were shown to me through her medical chart. And given her constellation of how young she was, the fever, the rash, and she was also having such low blood pressure, which was bringing her into the ICU, we thought she had a very serious bacterial infection um, known as meningococcus. And um, speed is of the utmost importance in treatment of this bacterial infection. And so antibiotics were prescribed. And um, that day, which was Saturday when I actually laid eyes on her, I was concerned enough, and thus I notified our public health department um, colleagues um, who found the girl's close contacts over the next 12 hours and prescribed them antibiotics to those persons to, to reduce their risk of getting this, this particular bacterial infection. But in the next 36 hours, and I've done this, as I said, for you know over 15, 20 years, there was minimal improvement in the little girl besides um, despite uh, antibiotics and the excellent care of our ICU um, colleagues. And I knew that this wasn't the right diagnosis, that meningococcus was not right, the, the right diagnosis. And so Monday I had to consider, we had to consider a different disease. Now around that time, um, I realized my video just cut out. Can you still hear me? We can, thank you. Okay, good, all right. I'm probably in a very awkward position, I apologize. So, um, uh, MISC had been um, started to be described in the past um, three to four months prior to um, my seeing this particular patient. And MISC is a condition in which various body parts um, can become very inflamed. The heart, the lungs, the kidneys, the brain, eyes, ears, and the gastrointestinal organs. And this condition usually means being hospitalized in the ICU. And children with MISC either have had COVID in the past or around someone with COVID-19. And as of this time, um, we've had, excuse me, we've had 69 cases in Oregon. And the highest risks were um, the kids between five and 11 years. So she was a little younger, as I, as I mentioned, she was eight months of age, but you know, I didn't have another diagnosis and she wasn't getting better on my antibiotics. And we had gotten a history that the child's mother and grandmother had tested positive by a nasal PCR for COVID two months ago. The little girl wasn't sick and so she wasn't tested and she was really only around the mother, um, the grandmother, and um, a close neighbor. And while in the PICU, we tested her blood and she showed that she had been exposed to COVID-19 and likely then had an asymptomatic infection two months prior, which probably was a setup for her MISC. So we started treatment for the little girl for MISC and because we were also scared about a possible bacterial infection, we completed her course of IV um, antibiotics. And so she eventually left the hospital and she went home after a total of um, two weeks 
when I say she left the hospital, I meant she went home. And, um, uh, and then she has um, done well since. I do have another case, but out of interest of time, um, I will defer that. But I think I wanted to use this case to illustrate two points. Is one, um, children have um, become sick with many diseases and that MISC needs to be now added to that long list of kids in which whom I would see in the hospital or in the ICU and to start treatment um, for them. So um, I know that you have seen this slide. This is the impact of COVID-19 on children in Oregon. You'll see the, the, the peak around um, September, which is the cases um, in kids um, from the Delta wave and Omicron follows that large wave and then a, a, maybe a, a wavelet. Um, with our current surge. And there have been eight pediatric cases um, of death um, from COVID-19 and 69 cases of MISC. But as I hopefully I highlight, MISC is not just um, a small illness. It often entails PICU care. A lot of multi multiple specialties are involved in that child and, um, and um, a lot of um, resources that are devoted um, appropriately to that. Um, so I will move now to long COVID. And um, these slides are courtesy of my wonderful colleague, Dr. Louise Vaz, and I hope will supplement, give the pediatric perspective to um, a uh, presentation that you will hear later this morning from our adult colleagues at OHSU, but this is the pediatric perspective. And long COVID, there's, a, there's not a whole lot of, there's a lot of definitions out there and there's not a great consensus, but really it's symptoms that develop during or after COVID, but they continue for 12 weeks or more and really are not explained by alternative diagnosis. It goes by a number of names. We used to call it long haulers, chronic um, COVID, long COVID and um, this new syndrome, which I didn't hear about until this morning called PASC. You know, it's really described as a waxing and waning um, condition and progress often is not really um, well documented in terms of what are the markers for improvement. It spans multiple body parts, has significant effects um, on health and quality of life for the child. And it, what's, what's always interesting to know is that you don't have to be very sick from your initial COVID you could be asymptomatic or you could actually have been hospitalized with COVID, but in your convalescent phase still have um, these persistent symptoms. And so these is, this is the symptoms um, that um, I downloaded from the CDC and it, you know, it's still you know, somewhat vague. They talk about brain fog and fatigue and shortness of breath. And this is very, um, I would think very scary for children and um, their families to have to look at their child who have these syndromes. Now, until recently um, at OHSU, we were privileged enough to have a um, long COVID team that would see uh, many of these kids. And I'll get into the numbers of, of the kids that we have seen. But you'll notice that given the, the diversity of um, body parts that are body systems that are affected by COVID, this is a very, very long list of people who are intimately involved in these kids because they have a number of complaints. And um, we, we sort of thought about this program as having spokes in that the center is the infectious disease doctor and or the primary care physician working in consult with all of these other people who give their time and expertise for the care of these kids. So as of this time, um, there have been over 100 referrals um, to the clinic, uh, 60 have been seen and 38 are actively managed at our clinic. Um, the rest are, um, the, the remaining of the 60 have been taken over by their PCP, perhaps because the number of subspecialists um, have gone from like 10 to like maybe three and can be managed by the PCP. But at this moment, the uh, pediatric long-term program at OHSU suspended due to uh, resource limitations, but we are still actively following the 38 kids. And we hope the committee would be interested in perhaps having a more thorough discussion about long COVID in an upcoming hearing. But I wanted to um, convey that um, we are uh, seeing kids with long COVID. So um, why do we want to vaccinate our children, even our very young children, against COVID-19? And so um, you have probably heard data previously that children can effectively uh, transmit um, the virus. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatric does report that one in 10 cases, um, or probably more, are in children right now. And infection is a setup for development of MIS-C and long COVID in children. And of course, there are indirect consequences of COVID in children, uh, particularly the um, increasing mental health visits. 
And um, I'm just going to provide this list that I think all of us intuitively know is happening um, and affecting our children um, that are indirect, maybe a little harder to, to quantify, but we certainly know that it's worthing of uh, mental and emotional health, widening of education gaps. Um, our kids are getting fatter. Um, this decrease um, healthcare utilization, decrease routine immunizations, and my um, outstanding colleague, Dr. Bakken, will speak on this. Uh, increase in experience, increase in adverse experiences, and of course, um, loss of uh, family members um, who would care for these kids. So we want um, people to be vaccinated, we want children to be vaccinated, because if they don't get COVID or if they get less severe COVID, um, hopefully that will decrease um, the um, direct and indirect medical consequences um, from their illness. So I thank you for your time. Um, I'm going to unshare myself. Oh, man, I got to find how to do that. Wait, haha, stop presenting. And um, thank you so much for your attention. I'm, it's always great. You can always invite me back to speak about kids. And um, I will now turn it over to uh, Dr. Hayes Bakken. Hi, so happy to be here with all of you guys as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Nolt. Um, thank you, Chair Dexter. Um, uh, so my perspective, um, just a little bit slightly different. So I am an associate professor of pediatrics um, here at OHSU. Um, of course, a, a, a loyal member of our Oregon chapter of the AAP as well. Um, and I've also um, been our point person uh, from at Dornbecker in responding to COVID in the ambulatory setting. So our various protocols, um, and then also you know education, um, things that go on our websites, and most recently was thrilled to be um, kind of charging our team with uh, getting the five to eleven year old children vaccinated. Um, and we learned a lot from those experiences and are thrilled to have our team meeting again and planning um, for what we hope is um, upcoming vaccines for children under five. Um, so a bit of my outpatient perspective, um, you know, both um, as a primary care physician and also um, getting our teams here at Dornbecker ready for these vaccines to come. I think the real important things to highlight about why we're so thrilled about the possibility of vaccines for these younger kids is that these kids under five have always been a somewhat more vulnerable group. Um, if we think about the fact that a lot of the layers of protections um, that you know we used uh, in the pandemic, um, they were always much more challenging for children in early childhood child care settings. Um, and for families of younger children. So remember that the AAP, and certainly as uh, pediatricians, we do not recommend masking ch children under two um, because of the potential risks um, of suffocation, that mask getting around, and then their own inability to take that mask on and off safely um, if they feel like they need to. Um, also, you know, thinking about childcare settings, even younger children, um, children were taking off their masks to eat and drink, to take naps, those kinds of things. And when you think about how often you need to feed a three-year-old to keep them happy and going all day long, um, you know, those layers of protection were always much harder in those settings. Um, so what we've seen is that our families of these youngest children, and especially here at Dorn Dornbecker, we serve so many families of children who do have underlying medical conditions, who have bright, wonderful futures ahead of them, but do have diagnoses that put them at higher risk. Um, we've seen that, you know, they really feel like they're back in 2020 right now. Um, those layers of protection have lifted. Um, many have pulled their children out of daycares and preschools or never had them enter. Um, they are juggling jobs and um, family child care arrangements um, and really struggling with just that, that calculus of every single decision. Do I take my child to this checkup? Do I go to the dentist? Um, do I enroll my child in early intervention? Uh, what does preschool look like for my child? Um, and so you know, for so many of these kids, this has just been really challenging, especially those with the higher risk underlying conditions. We haven't had the therapeutics available for these children. So remember, you know, Paxlovid is wonderful, um, you know, but as Dr. Seidlinger was saying, is under EUA and is not approved for children under 12. And even children over 12 need to be over 40 kilos, which we've seen in some of our children with medical complexity, that that's also a limiting factor for them. Um, and so families call us when their child with 
underlying medical conditions gets COVID and say, you know, what am I supposed to do? How can I prevent them from getting worse from being in the hospital? And, you know, we don't really have great um, options to offer them. Um, and so that has been, you know, a significant challenge. Um, so I know for many of the families, I have families um, of children. I know one family has multiple children with autism due to a genetic condition in their family. And they've made the difficult choice um, because that genetic condition also has other medical implications. Um, for the parent um, of one of those children, they've made the difficult choice um, to not have ABA providers in their home, um, to not have their children in childcare settings, um, because they have the combination of both the um, the developmental diagnosis of autism, but also other um, medical comorbidities, and two children in their household um, in this under five uh, category. So, you know, those kinds of decisions have just been really painful um, for families, and and walking through them. Um, as a provider, you know, very concerned about um, what that means for decreased medical care for those kids. And as Don mentioned, we've seen, you know, decreased just even routine vaccines rates as well. Um, and also, you know, the potential impacts on um, things like developmental services and education as well. Um, so we're really hopeful um, that things look good. It sounds like from everything we're hearing from the White House and, and from the um, from Pfizer and Moderna, it looks like um, there these trials, you know, met um, the met the efficacy thresholds and and we are excited for the possibility you know certainly after the process that's so important of having the fda and cdc review and sign off on these vaccines that we have the possibility in a few weeks of um i like to say putting vaccines in legs this time around um uh, and um, making sure that we can have these families feel like their children are getting that level of protection um, you know, I, I think it's important. Uh, there's a lot of focus on efficacy against contracting COVID, but remembering um, that vaccines in the older age groups have shown efficacy against other um, things like Miss C, that, like Don was, uh, Dr. Knoll was talking about, and um, also um, efficacy against um, potentially long COVID in older age groups as well. We don't have that data in these younger kids, but the hope is as we get more vaccines and this time in legs um, that we will be able um, to see those, uh, to, to provide families with that reassurance that those outcomes um, are decreased uh, by these vaccines as well as, as we have every reason to hope and believe they will be. So excited for that to come. Um, you know, a little bit about the unique uh, challenges that this age group presents. Um, uh, we are standing up our team at Dornbecker getting ready to do our own events. Um, we also collaborate really closely with our uh, vaccine equity committee um, as well. And um, as I keep mentioning, you know, the, the most common site for vaccine in this age group is going to be the um, kind of the front side or the anterior lateral part of the thigh. Um, and so that is because we need to use a bigger muscle in these kids. That's where kids routinely get their vaccines. Um, but for a lot of folks, uh, what we've been able to do is kind of a trickle down from the adults. If you could give an adult a vaccine in their arm, you can kind of learn how to adapt that technique for a child. And certainly the leg is a little bit different. You need to make sure that you understand the anatomy of the leg, you place that vaccine in the correct location. And it is going to kind of create some new workflow challenges um, for our sites as far as um, exposing a leg. Um, certainly, we hope that the weather will uh, get warmer here and we will be able to encourage children to come uh, to vaccine clinics in shorts. Uh, but, um, you know, we've talked a lot about how we make sure that families have privacy. And, um, you know, for some young kids, they may not care about getting undressed in a more public space but I think we need to be very sensitive and aware of that as well. And so some of the techniques and the strategies that we've used um, are needing to be a bit adapted. The other unique challenge um, is uh, that, you know, pharmacies do not vaccinate children under three. Um, there's, I've not heard any expected changes to that. And so there's going to be a real pressure on medical homes to provide these services uh, for their patients. And I know many of us are dealing with, um, it's not just a COVID wave, it's a respiratory illness wave. And, you know, we're very busy right now. We're seeing our own staff out. Um, so I know in my own practice here at Dornbecker, we're a little concerned about how just within the practice, we would provide the staffing and the rooms and the resources for that. And so I think some of these bigger events will be very important for making sure this vaccine is available to those who want it. Um, what we will be doing is um, holding events um, at off times um, 
probably on weekends um, in some of our inpatient spaces where we have exam rooms because having an exam table can be very helpful for this age group um, and um, basically planning to probably be able to give um, somewhere between 600 and 700 doses in a session uh, and spreading from there. Um, but when we look, we have over 5,000 patients who have been active patients at Dornbecker in even just the metro area. Um, and so, you know, as we look at those numbers, um, it's really going to be a team effort to make sure that those vaccines are available for the, the families that want them. And I think, you know, right now in this initial push, there'll be, you know, if we get these vaccines authorized, it'll be an initial push with many families. But then also as other families see that children get these vaccines and um, feel that feel that the vaccines are more safe over time as more children have gotten them, making sure that we also have the systems to continue to offer these services to families. So we will be doing our events here. Um, we use this also as an opportunity um, to bring in others that are important to OHSU's vaccine outreach efforts and the uh, Vaccine Equity Committee to train them and make sure they understand the techniques. Um, and so they will be working with us in those initial clinics, and then that will be part of our ability to reach out into the community and provide this as well. Um, um, through OHSU's reach. Um, so um, that's those are our plans. Happy to take any questions. Want to make sure there's plenty of time for dialogue or questions. Um, uh, but those were the, the, the key points I wanted to make sure folks heard from us. Thank you so much, Dr. Bakken and Dr. Noll. And I uh, misrepresented what Dr. Seidlinger was doing. He is not making an additional presentation. He's here for questions as well. Uh, so committee members at this time, we are going to open it up for questions. Please go ahead, Rep Reynolds. Oh, and I'm going to pause and acknowledge that Rep Prusak has been able um, to join us. So if we can just, for the record, uh, acknowledge that. Thank you, Rep Prusak. Um, Go ahead, yeah. Rep. Good morning. Thank you, um, Chair Dexter and Dr. Backen and Dr. Nolt. Um, will you will um, OHSU be opening up their clinics to non-Dornbecker families like you have in the past? That is the hope. Um, I, I will say that when we look at our own ability to do this work this time around with some of the you know shifting um, things as, as far as, uh, you know, interest in <laughs> that kind of, um, we, there's there's concerns about workforce and space, basically, um, and just funding for this work. And so um, what we have done in the past is done, um, we learned from some initial efforts when appointments go online, it's kind of uh, a, a little wild. Um, and so we are planning to do some specific outreach efforts um, to children with medical complexity that are connected to the Dornbecker system and offer them some of those first appointments. Um, we also um, pull our patients uh, from communities that, that have been disproportionately affected by COVID as well and offer up slots to them. Um, we will also probably try to do some waves of offering slots to our own primary care patients or uh, other folks connected to OHSU as well. And then whatever else we have available will put out there. We also have made a commitment. Um, I believe it's 30% of our slots are saved for community partners. And so those are partnerships that um, our vaccine equity committee has made um, with community partners. And uh, those community groups get specific links um, for the families connected to, to those groups um, to, to book as well. So um, there's a little bit of an effort to make it less of an online uh, click, 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 you know, insanity fest um, and try to make sure that we're um, getting some of the you know, much more vulnerable um, patients that Dornbecker serves, um, but we will make every effort to uh, make slots available more widely um, as we can. Thank you. 